Television City in Hollywood. It's The Late Late Show, starring Tom Snyder. I'm Mark Kennedy, inviting you to join Tom and his guest, Dennis Miller. And now, ladies and gentlemen, he... Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Very, very thoughtful. Mr. Kennedy has been playing Ed McMahon for a long, long time, and tonight he got his wish to do it with his own microphone, and I applaud that, and I thank you, sir. You honor me. Uh, I'm Tom. The color cast is on the air now for Friday night, the 26th of March, 1999. Dennis Miller here tonight, live and direct at CBS Television City in Hollywood, California. I'm nervous tonight. You know, this is the last one. This is the farewell, and there's a saying in my business that you're only as good as your last show, so I am going to try and be especially good tonight. I have some people I'd like to thank. First and foremost, David Letterman, uh, without whom I would not have had this job and whose generosity to me over the years has been genuine and beyond loyalty. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you, last night I went out to the parking lot with a bunch of people from uh, the show, and Mr. Letterman uh, sent to me uh, via flatbed truck a vintage Cadillac convertible in cherry condition. And I was so nervous, I couldn't get in the car and drive this thing. I mean, it's 28 feet long, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'm going to enjoy it. And my seatmate was Mark Kennedy, who has a passion for vintage cars, especially convertibles. We got in the car, and Kennedy's first words were, geez, the clock works. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, thank you for your kindness to me. I want to talk here for a second or two about Bruce McKay, who is the producer of this program who has been with me now for 25 years and more on The Tomorrow Show and uh, here at The Late Late Show at CBS. Let it be said that in our younger years, Mr. McKay and I took on all comers, if you catch my drift. There was a time when Mr. McKay and I were convinced we could, we could drink all they distilled, but we gave that notion up years and years ago and have now faded happily into what Brokaw called geezerdom last night. <laughs> Uh, the people here at CBS, Les Moonves, the president of CBS, uh, Mitch Semmel from back in New York, and Vinny Favala, but especially to Dorian Hannaway, who is the director of late night programming for CBS on the West Coast, whose kindness to me has been absolutely unquestioned during the past four years and three months, and I will love her till the day I die, and I thank her for all the good things that she has brought to my life. Uh, to the people in this studio who I work with here night after night, and have for the past 887 to Mike Schwartz and Paul Wyoman and Gordon McBride on the cameras uh, with a, a, a tip of my hat to uh, Ray Fagelski, who is with the Dear Lord and the Angels tonight, uh, Steve Coffey and Bob Marinkovich on the crew here, and to Mark Kennedy, my stage manager, who has been my guiding light here and, and my shepherd and friend for uh, 867 nights or whatever. I thank you all very kindly, and I am in your debt. May I also thank all of you who call me today, especially those of you who got the machine. I, I could see people all over the country, their secretary saying, it's the machine, take it, you know. <laughs> they don't have to talk to the son of a gun. And finally, may I thank you who have watched me and listened to me on radio and television for over 25 years in this country. Uh, you're great people to work for in this time period because you get it and because you understand it and because your, uh, your, your curiosity and your interest in things uh, surpass those of people who watch in other day parts. I am convinced of that. You know, you and I didn't get the greatest time period in the world. We got stuck with 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we don't get as big a crowd as they generate at 9 o'clock at night or at 1130. Uh, in my particular case, we haven't won this time period against the competition in the four years plus I've been here. But I think we've had a wonderful time together uh, having fun and learning things about ourselves and about the world. Now, I promised you here on the last night that I would, I, I, I would resolve a couple of things. You know, I was going to you know, talk about some people I don't like, which I'm not going to do. But I want to I, I resolve the Larry King thing, because over the past year or two here, I've made these comments about the thing that I like most about Larry King. The two things I like most are his face. Larry King, <laughs> you say, well, why are you on Larry King's case? And I'm going to tell you why, okay? About three years ago, maybe a little longer, uh, Larry King did an interview with David Letterman on his program on CNN. And in the commercial break of that program, Larry King manipulated David Letterman into a conversation about this program, which was extremely negative and caused Letterman to make comments which he thought he was making about something else in a very, very uh, uh, negative manner. 
uh, he thought he was making about something else were applied to this program. And by the time this manipulated conversation conducted by Larry King got to the press, there were headlines, you know, that, that, that uh, David Letterman hated me and hated this program and I didn't like him and we were all, and there wasn't a kernel of truth in all of it. And Larry King knows better and he shouldn't have done it. But you know, I believe in my heart of hearts that there comes a time when the penalty box is opened. And Larry, the penalty box is open tonight. I accept your apology. Uh, that you're out of the penalty box, but don't do it no more. Round of applause. No, no, that, please, please. <laughs> you know, we'll take a standing ovation, rehearsed or spontaneous, yeah. Uh, let me tell you about Mother Snyder, who knows that tonight is my final night here. She's a little concerned about that. She's in great health, by the way. And if you said stuff to the Lord on her behalf, I thank you for that. She's in very good health. Her cough is almost gone. She looks terrific, and her appetite is back. And I talked to her by phone today, and she knows tonight's the last night, and she says, Tom, what are we going to use for money? I said, <laughs> I said, you know, Mom, I, I really don't know. She says, well, maybe we'll print some down here. So. <laughs> and finally, uh, for the last report on, on my, uh, my sheepdog uh, that I will take to sheep herding school beginning next week to begin my new career as a shepherd, Oliver is fine. I give you his photograph today, freshly groomed and delightfully out of focus as only I could have taken it. <laughs> so that is all I have, except I do want to thank two people who are the last faces I see here every night before I come before you. That is Carrie Fetman, who dresses me very well and has for the past four and a half years. And dear Kelly Greer, uh, who somehow erases the ravages of time and occasional late night misconduct with makeup on my puss every night. Thank you, folks, and thank you all for watching, and thanks for keeping the good thought. I'm Tom. You're watching CBS. Fire up the color teenies now and catch Dennis Miller as we fly him through the air right after these messages. Over the course of the past four years plus, there have been hundreds of people as op opposite me in the guest chair on this program, but nobody is more welcome than the man who sits across from me right now. On our last night at CBS, it is a great pleasure to have Dennis Miller in the chair, and thank you, my friend, for coming on, and you honor me by being here tonight. Did you ever know that you were my hero? Tommy, Danny, I, am, Danny. I can't tell you how tough Listen, I, I was. Am. I was watching Letterman last night, and he had on Elton John, who was trashing Roberto I Benigni. Heard about I this. was, un and, and the more Dave tried to get him off well, the what track, he, what negative could he say about Benigni? Well, what he wasn't say? funny. He didn't like his physical type. He doesn't act like that in life. Blah blah blah. And he was really getting bitchy about it. And then I saw you tonight on HBO with this guy Kitchens. Yeah, Christopher Hitchens. Yeah, Hitchens, Hitchens, Kitchens, well, Hitchens. Oh, yeah. He makes Elton John look like Leo Biscaglia because this guy came out and waded into Mother Teresa. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. Just lit into her. So now you sit down. I'm sitting there. I just said, hi. I go, hi, you're a man of strong opinions, Chris. Boom, boom. Big body shots on Mother Teresa. I'm sitting there like... I, you know, like, uh, there's a lot of people in the world I got to get pissed at first <laughs> yeah, before I start taking it out of the woman working with the lepers. <laughs> you know, he's there, she rides on Learjets, and I'm saying, I've seen a lot of jerks getting off Learjets. Why not give her a Learjet, for God's sake? She says, leprosy is a gift from God, and I say... Yeah, but he includes a receipt. You can return it. You know, I'm trying to anything. <laughs> anything to stop it, right? And, you know, people are sitting there, my audience, I can see they think it's a bit of a put-on, but then he <laughs> just keeps wading into it. And, and what's happening in the seats? What's happening with the crowd? Well, quite frankly, crowd's pro Mother Teresa. <laughs> I would think they so. Are, yeah. they're, they're thinking, who is this guy, and why is he attacking this sainted woman? So I try to get him off onto Clinton, and then he goes off on a thing on Clinton that makes him look like he's the president of the Mother Teresa fan club. And at the end, they said, hey, call me in six weeks. Tell me what it's like to be gang audited, my friend, because they are going to be they are going to be doing an orifice search of you for receipts. <laughs> So, what do you do? He well, was a good guest. He was a nice guy. I mean, you meet him off stage, he's so reticent and sheepish. He's just one of these guys. <laughs> yeah, but who, the minute he gets out here, a pit bull on the attack. Yeah, okay. Let me ask you here. You've had a couple of career transitions along the way. Yeah. You had to do a last Saturday Night Live weekend update, had to do a last late night Dennis Miller show for Tribune. What's it, what's it been like well, for you? Well, the last Saturday Night Live, I was, it was devastating. Uh, really? And I had left to my own volition to go do that Chicago Tribune show. But I do remember when I left all my friends, uh, we have a party at the end of the year down right. at that ice ring at Rockefeller Center. I got in a car, I was heading home, and I looked down, and 
you know, I really erupted. I, I was going to miss, I really felt like I was in with good friends there and we had done something sure. that was reasonably good. You know, there were times it wasn't good, but I thought we were pretty good at it. The Tribune show, I, I man, I was off that stage into a pneumatic tube and on my way <laughs> to Santa Barbara. You know, it was, I was glad to get out of there because I was in that weird place where I wanted to do that Tribune syndicated show mm -hmm. Because quite frankly, the, at the end of the day, you roll the dice, and if you hit in syndication, you make so much money. A lot of money. You're printing money. A lot of money. And yep. I thought I gotta roll the dice. I've been on SNL sure. six years. It's I think the demo there is 14 to 18. They might act like they're Algonquinian, but I, I think they're targeting kids. I was a 35 year old guy. I thought I better go try it. Sure, this. sure. So I got whacked after six months, and quite frankly. I wasn't saddened at all because no, I was in that me. unfortunate place where I wanted to try it and I wanted it to be successful, but if it would have been successful, I would have been on TV every night for the rest of my life and I was already, I think, on the early verges of a nervous breakdown. You know, I remember standing backstage some nights thinking, oh Christ, what am I doing? It's like, I read an excerpt in Stephanopoulos' book about where, you know, he's right where he wants to be finally yeah. in the belly of the beast with Clinton, the most powerful man in the world. He's his aide de camp and he's in there flaming out because he hates it. And that's kind of where I was. I finally got the gig I thought I wanted wanted and it was just a night you see that's the thing and that's one of the reasons I'm happy to leave here I've had a great run with this show and the others I've done but Dennis I I don't have any more in me you know I just I'm I'm I'm, I'm on the verge of being bored with it which sounds stupid but yeah, you but where do you think listen man how many guys what, what are you made I didn't even know what you've made it 25 years doing something like this well I had tomorrow for eight eight and a half years then I had five years on ABC radio uh, two and a half years at CNBC and four and a half here so I you know I've had a great run well, with this. to me You've gone way past the half-life that most guys go through, you know what I yeah, mean? Most yeah. guys get burnt out a decade ago. I, it's only natural to me to think that, what, you know, TV is such hallowed ground in this country that you kind of get on it, and I'm sure you were like this when you first got on it. I just couldn't believe I was on it. Oh, same I here. Thought, same here. I can't believe I'm on TV. Yeah, I'm on TV. And then after a while, you get to see... You know, just because you get a lucky break, it doesn't mean you do it until they wheel you out. I was talking with you about, or I was talking with Peter backstage about Carson LaSalle, who knows yeah. Carson from ages. Who, who was cleaner than Carson about it? I mean, he's right in the thick of it for 30 years. 30 years, yeah. And then he blows, and the legend only builds because he's never done anything. That's right. I mean, it's beautiful. That's it gives right. you chills because you think everybody's going to need a little jolt of it. Everybody's going to yeah. need the juice a little. Yeah. You never see him. He's, no, the only no. he's out there playing tennis. You know who else, although Jack Park came back a little bit, but remember when Jack went, you didn't see him anywhere for a long time. Then he came back to ABC very briefly, and then he's been gone, and he hasn't, he hasn't touched it since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, the, you know, Jack was a... I, I don't know him. The little I've seen about him and read about him, he seemed like too delicate a soul. It seemed like too painful an extraction fragile. for him on very, a nightly yeah, basis. Very fragile. You know what I mean? Carson, I, I just think he bellied up to the bar each night and sold it, and he went home, and I don't think there was a lot of soul-racking stuff. He no. was just good at it. Yeah, he yeah. knew how to do it. He was the state of the art. And I think he went home, and he looked at Alpha Centauri through the telescope, had a color teeny. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know what I mean? And unwound. I think Jack went home, put himself on the rack, and said... <laughs> I should have did this ad lib, you know? <laughs> you know, it just was too How painful. How did you get the gig? You know you've got the best gig in showbiz. What do you do, yeah. 26 half hours a year? Well, it's a good lesson for anybody about, uh, you know, what is that old quote about life is what happens while you're making other plans? And there's no truer example of that to me. I got whacked from that show, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, God. Uh, now, you know, I remember thinking my game plan was going to be get in the back of the line for a couple years and just shut up. Yeah, you've told me that. But, yeah. You know, and, and then uh, I got a call from Michael Fuchs at HBO, who just happened to be a fan of mine. And he said, listen, I know you're wounded right now. Take a while and uh, get your head together and then come here and work for me. Wonderful. Oh. I mean, it was like such a, you know, a stamp of approval. I knew I had a gig again. Sure, hope and now, HBO. Sure. I'm telling you, I do have the best gig. Yeah, I mean, do. HBO is nothing but supportive for me. I do have a half hour, 26 weeks a year. And, you know, at the beginning, I remember angling to get on every week. And HBO just saying, you know, we're not a, we're not a classic network. No. We, we don't want you for more than 26 weeks. We like what you do. We're not denigrating you. We just don't program like that. Weeks we and play. it is perfect because that latter part of the year is just sorbet. I think my monkey trick gets tired if you watch it every night. After six months, I think they're thinking, yeah, I can take the smart ass oh, thing oh, again yeah. for another How many six times months. Can we watch Miller to use the F word on camera. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Mondo. Exactly. You know, exactly. so it, just when they, just when <laughs> that, you know, they they feel like oh, I could take that again, and then at the end of the run, they're thinking, please take a break for a while. Let Chris Rock say the F word for six months. <laughs> <laughs> We're chatting here with Dennis Miller. Back with Dennis and you on the toll free after this break. <laughs> 
where with Dennis Miller, uh, you know, I can tell you that over the past four years plus here, some of the better moments have taken place in the break, and one of them just did, and I hate to ask you to reenact something, but you told the story of Clinton waking up one morning and rolling over. Well, we were talking about Clinton, and you said sometimes on my show I seem, uh, you, you, know, you know, and he's the president of the United States, and I'm telling you, I'm not saying this for a fact, is that means nothing to me. Nothing at all. I mean, it's, it's a democracy. It's a place where anybody can be the president. I don't look at him and think he's some sort of ubermensch or... Special person. Yeah, superman. He is just a guy, to me, who woke up in a backwater state one morning and had the audacity to roll over in bed and look at his old lady and say, Honey, I want to be the leader of the free world. And the only difference between him and me is my wife would have looked at me and said, Shut the hell up and go mow the lawn. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the only difference. She said, Okay, let's, let's go for it. Let's do it. Let's you know, go for because it. she wants it as much as him. Yeah. I find it brilliant that she's going to run for the Senate. And in by New the York way, now. remember when the impeachment trial was all over, all of a sudden the news was dominated by Hillary running for Senate from. Where did that trial it's balloon go a, up? It's, it's an obvious, easier PR fix. It's, it's, a, it's a flack. I don't know who in the White House is figuring that out, but it's genius flack. The guy looks anti Clint or looks anti woman in wake of you know uh, kind of ravishing a young girl who's right. working for him and the Juanita Broderick allegations he looks like he really has a hate for women in some ways so how do you compensate for that you take the woman in his life and he tells her to sally forth and go conquer on your own I'm pro with you I'm with you honey I've had my time in the limelight now it's time for you to shine right, right. and all of a sudden these pro woman again but I, I love that she's picked New York yeah you know because uh, these people are like they're like Boris Spassky. They're six chess moves down the line. I know Bill's pushing New York because it's not a community property state, you know? <laughs> <laughs> she ain't running no, for no, nothing no. in California because he's getting 200 a pop for speaking engagements. He don't want to be handing out 100 of that for the next seven years. So they're just beautiful the way they work. She, you know, she was just smart enough. And the reason I think Hillary Clinton wrote Bill, a woman that smart, obviously that talented, I think the reason she rode his coattails, coattails for so long is because early in the relationship, it became obvious to her that there was no room to cling to on the front of any of his clothing, so <laughs> she had to get on those coattails. <laughs> it took you a little while to she's, get there, uh, but it was good. <laughs> she's got a lot of resolve. Though. She's, uh, there is Mike on the toll-free in Oshawa, Ontario. Hi, Mike. You're on the air. Hello. Hello. Uh, well, it's good evening to you, Tom. Thank you, Michael. Okay, uh, Dennis, have you ever gotten any negative feedback from anybody concerning you ragging on them? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know what? And I'm not even, I don't even try to hide from it. I, there are people who should dislike me. I did a joke one night about uh, Barry Goldwater had married some 30-year-old woman mm -hmm. or something, and I did a joke on Weekend Update or somewhere about uh, the new Mrs. Golddigger, I mean Goldwater. You know, it's just a throwaway yeah. about a third. And I met the daughter of the woman. And she came up to me in a restaurant, and she got right in my face and said, that was a view. That was, that's my mother. And you know what? I, I wasn't even going to do that thing where you try to self-efface your way out of it. I, I said, I'm sure you really dislike me, and you should. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm in the business of knocking these jokes off once in a while. That mm -hmm. didn't seem like the most hurtful joke to me, but to you it must have been. And I, I would, I, if I even apologized to you, that's phony to me. It was a joke. I did it. You mm -hmm. should dislike you should hate me. me. You should dislike me. I mean, it's. Listen, you're going to be in the smart. I, I, well, I tell you, I try to leaven it by making fun of myself. Nobody's more intimately acquainted with their foibles than me. I. True. I know it's ridiculous. I saw running the night my hand through my hair. That that chimpy I, laugh I do. That is my laugh. But I, I hear it sometimes. I go, shut up with that laugh. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Well, I saw you the night you walked out and made fun of your hair. Well. I really don't care about my hair, but I mean, no, a lot of people think you hair. do. Uh, you know, I'm, I care that I'm going bald, and there's nothing worse than a smartass going bald in front of America. You know, <laughs> I come out and sell that attitude only, eventually. It, I look like Jimmy Carville. It's not going to work anymore. It's only, you know? 20, only 26 weeks a year. Don't worry about it. <laughs> or, get, or get the plugs. One of the two. But uh, I, I just think that, uh, yeah, there are people I've had people. I remember Arnold Schwarzenegger once. Uh, I made poke fun at him at the uh, MTV Awards. Just something silly about a loud shirt he had on. And I showed up at this gig in Las Vegas. It was a party, and I see Arnold across the room, and he looks at me. You know, and Arnold, sweet, he's a sweet enough guy, but he has that, you know, he's built like a rock. Yeah, he's got that, that bulk. He goes like this and starts walking towards me. I think, oh, God, I'm about to be pulverized by Conan, you know? And, yeah. <laughs> 
he comes up and he's, Dennis, I hear you think I'm mad at you. And I go, well, I don't know, Arnold, I made that joke about you and somebody told me you were a little... He said, believe me, you will know when I am mad at you. It's like I'm watching a Dana Carvey sketch, you know? He's like, <laughs> right, I will tell you to your face, you know? And he was sweet about it. But yeah, there's people who don't like you. And you know what? I think if you're in TV, if you're visible, if you're doing opinionated stuff, there are people who there are, are not people going to dislike like you, you right. and you're leading a goofy life if you're trying to get everybody to like you. Mike, I'm glad you called, and thank you for watching us tonight, sir. Well, thanks, Tom, and I guess it was goodbye to you. And it is goodbye indeed, luck. Mike. Thanks okay. for calling, sir, and have a great oh, weekend. Where okay? do you get sure. off with that sucking up, Tom? <laughs> we, we will continue. <laughs> no, he doesn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't much care for you. I guess. <laughs> Dennis Miller is the star of Dennis Miller Live on HBO on Fridays at 11.30 Eastern Time. Back with Dennis and you on the toll-free if time permits after this long but important word from our sponsors and the CBS Television oh, Network. Oh, oh. With Dennis Miller, who I know you want to leave, and I'm going to get you out of here in just a couple of minutes. Tommy, I'm staying in town. Oh, you're kidding. Big hey, night for me. Hey, we'll go out. Here is Joshua on the toll-free in Milan, Ohio. Joshua, thanks for calling, and welcome to CBS. Hello. Good evening. How are you doing, Tommy? Fine, Joshua. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Very good, very good, sir. Good, I mean, good evening, Mr. Miller. Nice to see you. Hey, Josh. How are you doing? Um, I just have a question. Um, who did you admire most in the uh, entertainment and comedy business uh, when you were growing up? Dean Martin. Because <laughs> he just didn't care. Right. <laughs> I mean, that vague indifference to the very thing that he made a living off of used to be the swingingest vibe I ever felt. How about at the end? Me and my genie read your letters and stay up every night right. thinking about and, you. And the <laughs> night he came down the steps and flopped onto that balsa wood piano and it just crashed beneath him <laughs> and he got up still holding the drink. <laughs> that is like Neil Armstrong on Tranquility Base. Now, that is a beautiful TV moment. Okay. Dino. Um, he was... I heard the greatest Dean Martin. Well, I can't even tell you because it's profane, but uh, I just like the way well, he handled it. Well, can't you clean it up a little bit? No, nah, it's too, it's built on the profanity, oh, but okay. it's a great story about him and Jerry Lewis. I just admired his, listen, I'm not going to belittle this. I love show business. When I get away from it for too long, I want to talk it with somebody. I don't talk it every day, but I, I dig the rhythm. I'm a shy kid who got like the Candyland thing. You know, mm -hmm. I can't believe I'm in show business, so I dig it. But I don't take it seriously at all because you get a certain amount of time, you get a pass through, eventually they tire of it and you're gone. And I think that you uh, have to handle that with a degree of dignity because you got more than you should have in the first Absolutely. place. It is a, it is a, a, a multitude of gifts you get when and you're in show business. And blessings. Yeah, I, you know, we're talking, I mean, look at the run you've had. I, I, don't, I don't even know the inner machinations of your ending here. I don't know what, if you want, you know, I don't know any of that. All I know is it can get real ugly in show business real quick. You can step out there and put your best foot forward and six weeks later they whack, whack you, you and you are never heard from again unless it's over a bad microphone at a drive through window of a Wendy's in Pocato. You know, so <laughs> it, gets re it can get really ugly. <laughs> <laughs> really quick. So, you know what I mean? It's, I know what you mean. I just admired Dean Martin for his sort of insouciant attitude about it. Yeah, that always yeah. made me laugh so hard. Joshua, thanks for calling and thanks for watching us. I hope through the years. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye now. You used a, a story, you made a joke with, uh, not about your son, but with, with, with your son and your rant tonight. You were talking about uh, uh, skepticism. We talked about your boy the last time, and he was starting chess, as I recall. Is, is he still the chess player? Nah, he's, he plays a little here and there. He's a bright kid, though. He had a moment the other night, Tom. I tell you, it was a gift from God. I really believe that. I, I really believe that. I'm not saying that to be maudlin. My, my boy is not uh, the most aggressive player when he plays sports. Mm -hmm. He's, a, he's a, a bit reticent, mm -hmm. a sweetheart of a boy, and a pretty good athlete when we're alone in the backyard. You know, hits the jumper pretty yeah, good. Yeah. But he gets out there, and he's kind of reserved, you know? Okay. And I always tell him, hold it, you got to go for it. This yeah. is aggression. Maybe a little and, shy? And... And, yeah, well, I think because he's eight. He's on the cusp. He's yeah. a little younger than the other boys. I think next year will be more. But right now, you know, sometimes he just doesn't like to dive in. He feels like it might not be his place or something. So the other night, he's in this basketball game, and... Uh, one of the little kids actually gets into it with the ref. It's so funny how kids watch TV now, and they're actually getting to the point where they mimic these guys. Right, they see the NBA guys I, get into it. This kid gets into it with the ref, and they call a technical on him. He gets two foul shots, and our coach is beautiful. Uh, the best player on the team steps up to shoot the foul shots, and the coach says, no, let Holden shoot him. And my son steps up. 
you know, and the whole gym, there's nobody even on the free throw line. It's him alone. The whole gym's watching. Swishes too. Oh, man. Oh, Tommy. It was the most beautiful thing. I said, thank you, God. I mean, he turned around. He was just beaming. Uh, I felt like Benini. I'm, I'm just bouncing around. I want to fall into your sea of free throw love. Beautiful. And did the crowd love him? Oh, they went crazy. Perfect. perfect. Tommy, it was one of the sweetest Has he got your sense of humor? Well, he's a little wry, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, when you're that young, it's tough to be as cynical as me, you know. <laughs> he believes, you know, he, he's a little joyous, so it's a little softer to mine. But sometimes he'll say something that's clever enough that I think, wow, maybe there's a, maybe there's a raging misanthrope somewhere inside that body. Very sweet. Swish, too. Thank you. Oh, Tommy thank swished you. him. Beautiful. Did not hit the rim. Beautiful. Now, would you ever want to do something like host the Oscars? You know, I just, I, I'm not in that game. No. Listen, I cannot, I tell you what, I wake up every morning after the Oscars, and it's so magical, and I really love it. And people who say it's four minutes and two, let it be six hours. I just dig it. You I like dig, it. See, okay. I you, dig you, seeing the Asian woman come up, just shattered that she's won. You know, I dig seeing a guy like Benini. I dig seeing the pros like Hanks and Spiel. You know what I mean? Sure, uh, there's I a whole. I love the whole thing, because showbiz is magic at some point, and that's as magical as it gets yes, that it night. Does. And I always wake up the next morning after the Oscars with a little bit of melancholy, because I think to myself, why don't you try something? Like yeah. writing a screenplay or something. Wouldn't that be fun? Well, you've done some movies, too. Yeah, I've done Bordello of Blood. I'm wasting vampire hookers. You're not going to see me down there getting the Eric Thalberg Award for that. But, <laughs> but, you know, I do think, why don't you really try to dedicate yourself and write something? You know, I look at Damon and... Uh, you know, Matt and Ben, yeah. Affleck, and I think, wow, what a great script. Good Will Hunting, I thought it was great. I think, why don't you try writing something? Maybe you'll find out you can't do it, but maybe you'll find but out. Give it a shot. Yeah. Give it a try. And sure. uh, so the Oscars mean a lot to me, but I just don't have enough of a visible position. And you know what? It is so brutal, the scrutiny. I mean, I watched Letterman that year, and I have to be honest, I thought he was funny. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I wake up the next day, and here it is years later. He's still getting the hell beat out of him. And I think <laughs> and he's he looked pretty good to me. And he's beating the hell out Tommy of him. Tommy Colartini's, my oh, friend. Thank you. Thank this you. This is Lori Dunsworth, Lori, my friend. How are you? Nice to see Runs you. Runs a nice plot over here thank called you. Lola's on Fairfax. I asked him oh, to come over. Oh, I've heard about this. Oh, make some Colartini's for thank us. Thank you, sir. Tommy, you're a pro. That's thank, a, thank you, sir. You are a pro broadcaster, thank man. Thank you, sir. It's going to miss you, the media. I've worked for the movie business. Oh. Here's to my friend Tommy Snyder, do we have everybody. Any Let's do, give him a hand. Do we have any security in the house tonight? Jeez. <laughs> Who is that guy? I have no idea, but he was in my office right before I come down here. He says, I hear you're quitting. Would you like to do cameos? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got to get ahead, too. In any event, I'm down to a minute with you here, my friend. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for your friendship, continued success, and I hope that our paths will cross as we travel the highway of life, blah, 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 blah. Well, Tommy, I can't blah, blah, blah with you. You've been a classy guy with me. And I tell you, man, when I say a pro, you bump into around 10 of them in this business. There are a lot of people doing it with smoke and mirrors. But you've been on here. You've been interesting Thank for a you. couple decades okay. now. That does not happen. And as a viewer, I just want to tell you how appreciative I am of you as a television personality. Thank you, You're sir. good man. And I, hey, you're a good man, and I'm proud to call you my friend. Thank you. All Denver. right. Okay, kid. Take care. Safe home. And you're staying in town tonight, right? What was that phrase? Safe home. No. What? A. A. Oh. <laughs> AMF, huh? A little inside. Sorry. Oh. Can't go there. Thanks for having me, Tom. Okay, kid. AMF. The first word is adios, <laughs> and you can figure out the rest. <laughs> there. That's a good way Back to say with, it. Yeah. Back with some stuff after this. <laughs> I got a minute here before the next event on this show, and I'm just thinking if there's anybody that I have forgotten to thank or forgotten to mention through the years. And there's one man I would like to talk about for a second whose name is Dave Tebbett, who is not a well man, but is a dear man. Uh, Tebbett was the vice president in charge of talent over at NBC for a lot of years, and he always talked like this, pal. I tell you, pal, I fought those executives into the ground. <laughs> so whenever any, you try to talk like Tebbett, Tebbett your throat gets sore. Tebbett's job was to keep the talent at NBC happy, to mollify those of us who were upset at the, uh, the, uh, the myriad problems of being a star or an uh, announcer at NBC. And I remember one time, I, I, you know, I was steamed about something, and so Tebbett took me to lunch, and he says, I'll send you a television set. And his office looked, look, his office looked like, uh, like uh, uh, where they have all the appliances, the good guys, right? TVs, 
radios, stereos. To my house in New York come three RCA 19-inch color television sets, okay? Now, in 1975, the house burns to the ground. Not to, not to the ground, but it burns bad, and the TVs are all ruined. Tebbit found out about it. He sent three more color television sets. <laughs> then one time, I really got steam, so they said, we'll get you a car, and I wanted a Mercedes-Benz. So about three months later, Tebbit called me in New York. He says, hey, pal, your car is here. I said, Dave, that's great. He said, it's a Buick. <laughs> <laughs> So I salute Mr. Tebbit tonight, and I know he's not well and probably will not hear of this, but all of you should know that there once was a very good man who, that there is a very good man who bears that name. See, I, there, I, there was a very good man. It's another one of the mistakes I make here nightly. I have more to show you after these messages. The other day here, a handwritten letter came to the office. It must have been nine, ten pages long from a man whose name I can't recall. And this man took the time to watch almost every program that I've done in this series, over 850 programs, and note in longhand the grammatical errors that I've made as I speak with people on this program. Now, first of all, this man has got to get a life. That's number one. And, 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 and number two, all kidding aside, I talk pretty good. I have trouble with farther and further. I get those confused. And I've, I have trouble with you and me, like between you and me or you and I. I have trouble with that, and I admit that, but in the main, I'm pretty good. What I do have a problem with, and I confess this to you, my friends, before I go, is that I often um, commit malapropisms. I, I mix up words because I'm going so fast up here and trying to stay slow down here. Did, did you hear me just pause there for you? Yeah, you see? The, the, the disc just slipped a little bit before the synapse clicked in and it worked, okay? And Tim Mancinelli, who is a, a, a dear man and who is the associate director of this program, put together a reel. You know, Tim went back and he found things that I've done over the years that have either mangled the Queen's English or ma made me look more stupid than I am. I'm not really that dumb, I swear to you. So here, uh, over the past four years, are people and Tom in situations that no other host would ever show because they're so embarrassing. Take a look. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Hi, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, my watch is broken, and I thought it was a little bit earlier than it is. Good evening, folks. Now, the movie on the airplane, which is where I started here, was the picture that he he just made now with Helen Hunt, and he got the Best Actor award uh, as hard as it gets, as good as it gets. Excuse me. <laughs> as, 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 no, no, as good as it. Come on, it slipped out. Come on. Craig Kilborn referred to Monica Lewinsky as being fat. Don't email him. Email him. Now, don't email me. Email him. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, senior moment. And and did you want it to be autobiographical? Autobiographical? Or about yourself? Why? Just, 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 I'm having a tough time with simple words tonight. As a kid in New York in yep. the 1950s, who was Norman Hamlish? Or uh, Marvin Hamlish? Who's Norman, Norman Hamlish? Hamlish was a guy around the corner. I don't know. Or, uh, Norman, okay, I, I got everybody's name right last night. Hey. Now, come on. Now we have such a sweet and wonderful relationship. We are with Nora Dern, who's, or Laura Dern, who's... <laughs> I like Nora better, <laughs> Fine. actually. I'm glad you do. <laughs> or Lorna Doon. You could try, too. It's just <laughs> Now, the bad song book, and we're with Chuck Berry, my friends, came from a... <laughs> uh, excuse me. <laughs> Dave Berry, my friends. Uh, I'm in a band. I know you are. I'm in a rock Steven band. Stephen Wright's in the band, huh? Right. Yeah. What? No. What did you say? I say, isn't Stephen Wright in the band? Stephen King. Stephen King in the band. Stephen King and Amy Tan. And we're all do writers. Have, do you have the feeling that I'm not doing this show tonight? You know, I, I think I'm doing the Tonight Show tonight. I'm not here doing this show. I'm doing another show somewhere. And by the way, it's a damn fine show. And I'm trying to keep these two shows on track, and I'm having no success. Thank you, Tom. Let me ask you here about the high visibility that you and your husband, Tom Shanks, uh, have to endure. <laughs> And the reason I bring How this up... How do you know about his shank? <laughs> I beg your pardon? What? Huh? What, what did I say? Tom Shank. Oh, Tom Hank. I'm sorry. <laughs> when, when, when you were lobbying for the part of the Catwoman mm -hmm. and Batman, and it wasn't going your way, so you decided to walk onto the set one day unannounced in a Catwoman suit. Well, it wasn't on the set, and it wasn't 
it actually wasn't exactly unannounced, but it was uninvited. Okay. You know, yeah. so yeah. I guess yeah. well, that equates to well, the same thing. Call me Fisher, but the, to me they mean the same. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. So, so what's your question? Reading about you this afternoon, you grew up both in Southern California and in Paris. Well, actually, no, my mother grew up in Paris. Like I said, you grew up in <laughs> Southern California. <laughs> Now, your mom was a journalist, as I read. She, uh, she worked for a time for Vanity Fair magazine, right? Um, well, she actually worked for Harper's Bazaar. Harper's Bazaar, yes, right. Yes, she was. <laughs> We're going to work this out, I'm sure. I doubt it. <laughs> uh, keep in mind, never, pet, uh, never sweat petty things and don't... Never sweat petty things and don't pet sweaty things. It was... <laughs> Get off of me. <laughs> Jeez. I apologize to all those people that I, Tom Shanks, my God, Academy Award winner, yeah.